This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 98. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. First, before we get started, let's talk about our great sponsors. 1791 Gun Leather is the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, and they would like you to know their appreciation for the Second Amendment fuels their passion for gun leather and its representation of the original patriots of this great nation. 100% certified American steer hide joins four generations of professional leather artisans to create the perfect firearms holster. Carry your firearm with pride knowing that each 1791 gun leather holster is handcrafted to be the best holster for your firearm. See their full product lineup at 1791gunleather.com. The supporting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is Hodgden Powder. Available in granular powder and pellets, Hodgden's family of 777 powders gives muzzle-loading enthusiasts a quick-cleaning, low-odor, black powder substitute for rifle and pistol applications. To learn more, visit Hodgden.com. Well, today we're talking about a fascinating topic, big bore air rifles, with our friend and co-worker Tom McHale, the editor of American Handgunner magazine. When Tom isn't busy handgunning, he's an expert on air power and the editor of the Air Gun Wire. When I learned people have actually hunted Cape Buffalo with air rifles, I knew it was time to have a sit down with Tom. Now here's Tom McHale on big bore air rifles. Well, good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon. I hope I'm not taking you away from slaving away on American Handgunner Magazine, committing journalism there in your, your fortified bunker. <laughs> I love, I still I still crack up at that every time. Committing journalism. Exactly. It, it is like that nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you know, I, I can't, I don't tell people I'm a journalist. I'm not a journalist. Yeah. We're not journalists. Journalists do fake news and stuff like that, right? We yeah. don't really do news. We just talk about stuff we like. Like exactly. today. That's entertainment. Yeah. I'm an entertainer, not a journalist. Yes, you are. You are an entertainer. Well, well, before we go too far down this road, you are the editor of American Handgunner Magazine, my counterpart over there, America's second best shooting magazine. And uh, (laughs) you can hear this over. You can see his eyes rolling through the telephone. You you said the podcast would only be three minutes. We're done. (laughs) No, we love Guns Magazine, but we also love American Handgunner. But today we're going to talk to Tom's other alter ego his clark kent to superman or whatever and talk about big bore air guns a a subject that has fascinated me for a long time and tom happens to be the editor of the air gun wire in in his other time and so he's the closest thing i know to an expert in the matter of air guns so we're going to talk about new stuff and old stuff and and some crazy stuff so What would you, let's start out with really what is a big bore air gun? What would you, what would you call something versus my Red Ryder 17 caliber BB gun? Yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head there because um, I just, actually, I just did a column on this last night for the air gun wire Ah. on, on big bore. And um, I think, and I would make the case that 25 caliber and up is big bore. Uh Uh-huh. And my, my logic for that, I think is sound because if you can buy it at Walmart, it's not big bore. (laughs) Okay. Right. Yeah. Can we agree on that? Okay. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I've never seen anything bigger than that. They're kind of a bunch of sissies now with all their, their woke posturing and everything. So that's true. You know, I know they sell BB things and I know they sell 177 and, I think I found some 22 pellets and you can probably get 22 air guns there, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's about it. Yeah. So 25 is when, when things start to get interesting. That's my answer and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Well, I think the, the important point here is these aren't new. Um, you know, there's been a revolution in the last couple of years and, and clear, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Literally, I know folks have taken Cape Buffalo 
with air guns. But that actually started back in Lewis and Clark days, um, and actually before that, but they were probably the ones that really caught the fancy of the public because they took a big bore air gun on their famous uh, tour of the Western United States. Is that the craziest thing ever? Yeah. I mean, seriously, you you think, oh, Lewis and Clark, they probably had some muskets and maybe some (laughs) cannon or two and, you know, a bunch of guys wearing fur pants or leather pants and and all this stuff. But um, they actually did. They what they relied on for, well, not just putting food in the pot, but um, making a peaceable transition through potentially unfriendly territory. They relied on air guns. You basically impressing the natives is what they were trying to do. Yeah. So, so this thing, the one they carried was called a Girandoni, G I R A N D O N I, or, or I'm, I'm close. So don't, don't grade me on the spelling, but, <laughs> uh, but that's the gist of it. I think it came out in somewhere around 1780 ish. Um, they brought this thing along. It's, it's a steel tank in the back, you know, leather lined to hold the air in. I guess it's, I don't know, I suppose it was greased leather or something. And, and they had like a hand, bicycle pump type contraction the contraption that would fill this thing up and i don't remember the exact number of pumps but it was some insane number of uh, <laughs> of hand pumps to fill this thing up like a thousand or something and and uh, we, we ought to pause there for a second have you ever filled up an air gun by by hand with a hand pump i have not i've seen it done and i vowed never to do it myself okay so let's let's divert we're going to come back to lewis and clark in a minute but um but let's talk about this for a second because you think of pumping up a bicycle tire right mm-hmm. mine i ride a bike a lot mine holds like 55 pounds per square inch in my bike tires yeah. okay pump it up no big deal you know 5 10 15 20 hits with a pump and we're up and running so a modern air gun holds 3000 to 4500 <laughs> pounds per square inch so you got to stop and think about that for a second. Okay. When you, when you just start and the tank's empty, it's like, it's like a bike tire. Sure. No problem. I can do this. It takes two or 300, you know, whatever, fill this thing up. But when you get 50 or so in there, you are doing full body, you know, uh, hardcore weightlifting to, to operate this pump and, yeah. and jam air into this thing at that kind of pressure. So, so back to Lewis and Clark, uh, they, they had to fill these things by hand, you know, they didn't have electric compressors at the time on, on their journey. So they would do that and they would uh, travel around. And when they would come up on a, a new band of American Indians or whatever, and they had to make their way through, you know, that territory without getting scalped or, or attacked or whatever, they would say, you know, make friends, say, hi, how you doing? You know, <laughs> glad to meet y'all. Hey, you know, Hey, we thought we might want to watch, want to see some of our new toys, you yeah. know, and they'd whip out the air gun and they'd launch a few, large caliber lead balls at an oak tree and when the uh, when the native americans saw these things embed inches into an oak tree and, and repeat you know it's mm-hmm. a repeater uh, yeah. because they had a big old air tank on the back uh they got real friendly real fast you know they kind of <laughs> lewis and clark they, they kind of led everyone to assume that everybody was armed with one of these magic repeating guns yeah cool stuff but it just raises so many questions i mean uh, how did they they know what the pressure was i can't imagine there were primitive gauges back then but or maybe they did there was a uh, a drawing of a thumb on the on the side <laughs> of the uh, on the side of the tank you know uh-huh. you hold your thumb up yeah it looks about right oh my god i don't know yeah it's does i guess you go by feel or count yeah. maybe you know wow uh, crazy but apparently the thing got a, a fair number of shots per per charge before yeah. the the lowest ranking dude had to fill it back up again for the next day i was i almost said that earlier that you know whoever the uh, assistant scullery you know and rookie uh <laughs> you know i'm sure he was the one that they they detailed to do that but so from lewis and clark to today they've they've been around a long time but i think the interesting thing is now you're starting to see a lot of companies uh come out with them and you're even seeing states put in place regulations, including up to mm-hmm. deer hunting with an air rifle. Yeah. And that almost sounds like some kind of joke I'd come up with, but it's it's an absolute really real thing. Yeah, it is. I was actually um, just kind of rummaging around. If you go to um, Pyramid Air with, with all Y's, P-Y-R-A-M-Y-D, air.com, they have a, um, a hunting map. It's this neat little application they've developed. And you click on your state and it 
tells you the air gun hunting regulations wow. in, in that state, you know, which what types of game you can take. And uh, a lot of states, just, as you have said, have defined, you know, things for air guns. They say if you're going to shoot with an air gun, that's fine. Uh, it has to be X caliber or Y foot pounds of energy uh, and you're good to go. Yeah. So, yeah, and they've they've embraced it and recognized it. Now, you know, check your local regulations as as to whether the seasons are different or whether it's regular, you know, rifle season uh, that you have to use your gun. It varies. Well, you you made a great analogy. You know, you asked me, do you muzzle load? And I do. And you know, I've got a bunch of different ones, but typically the one I use the most is my uh, my hand built Hawken, and it's fifty four caliber. But basically, mm-hmm. I'm shooting a lead a patch lead ball. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's essentially what the air rifles are doing, uh, but using uh, like mini ball type things, uh, you know, three, four, five hundred grain projectiles, and they're putting them down range pretty fast. And that's why Mm -hmm. there's been, again, even African game up to Cape Buffalo taken with these things. Yeah, really. It really is. I mean, people I I kind of catch myself because I I tend to say pellets when talking about air guns. But when you're in the 30, 45, 50 caliber range, what you're really talking are big lead slugs. Yeah. I've got a a shelf full of uh, projectiles from the folks at Hunter Supply. And they happen to specialize not not just for muzzle loaders and center fires, but they do a ton of uh, air gun projectiles, big board stuff. Mm hmm. And uh, yeah, we're talking, you know, three, four, 500 grain lead slugs that fly out the nozzle at close to a thousand feet per second. Yeah. So I had a um, Air Force rifle in for a while I was doing some testing with, and um, I got some 143 grain lead balls from Hunter's Supply, <laughs> 45 caliber. And this thing, this rifle would uh, launch us at over 900 feet per second. Wow. So. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things when I've I've fired several of these at various media events, and I think what's really interesting is they have recoil. Uh, you know, they get they got mm-hmm. some kick, but the muzzle blast is actually there's really not a lot of difference <laughs> between that and a powder gun. I mean, you know, you're shooting one of these things. They they make noise and they kick. They do, and uh, it's interesting. Now, on the the plus side of that is air guns aren't subject to all the the crazy firearm laws which means air gun most people call them moderators in the air gun world but they're silencers slash suppressors whatever term you want to use that's what they are they are not only legal and normal but encouraged Ah. all that stuff ships straight to your house so (laughs) yeah i mean i i like to i like to make the analogy to people of um it's not necessarily in the center fire world it's not the the fire and the the burning that is causing the the muzzle blast and the noise it's the massive difference in pressure you know coming mm-hmm. out the the muzzle into a lower pressure thing it's like a it's like a balloon you know if you pop a balloon with a pin you get a big bang right even though the air is cold and there's no fire if you let it out gradually at the bottom you get a pfft, <laughs> right <laughs> so same same concept you know so yeah. air guns will make some noise that's why uh pretty much Boy, I would say, if not all, a large majority of uh, larger air guns come with some kind of built-in or add-on suppressor. Yeah. Well, that, that's really incredible. And from the hunting side, uh, which that's the, the only part of this I really know much about, like I said, it's it's becoming more and more common because it's not just big bore air rifles, but we've got arrow uh, pneumatic guns mm-hmm. now and you know just there's all kinds of different technology coming out and then you throw in the muzzle loaders that are are cartridge based uh, like the traditions yeah. nitro fire which i reviewed about a year ago and my own state um the laws are not final yet but uh, they were illegal to use for deer so it looks like they're going to be legal this fall um but it's funny how all these different technologies are very effective but the laws haven't kept up with them yeah they're they're getting there but i tell you those uh i don't even really know what to call them the the air rifles that shoot arrows are are let's say impressive have you ever done anything kind of kind of not too smart when you're testing a, a new gun uh, for the purposes of this podcast, no, never. No, me either. But I heard about a guy. I, there's who a guy. Was testing, I know. There's a guy, and uh, he was he was testing. I think it was a I think it was a Benjamin, uh, one of their models that that shoots arrows. 
And, and the guy was so impressed at the velocity, which this thing launched errors. He said, wow, we had to try this into some wood, you know, mm-hmm. just to see what happens. And, uh, I heard that, uh, when you shoot one of those into a tree or into a, you know, a six by six, uh, that it pretty much kind of goes about the, the point comes out the other end, let's ah. say. Um, <laughs> so you, you now have a permanent archaeological uh <laughs> Are you, you're artifact. saying they didn't so get that arrow back years from now some <laughs> some archaeologist is going to come upon this tree it's like wow this look at what this is you know the, yeah. the ancients must have uh inserted coat hangers through the trees or something <laughs> the guy had fun doing it so he so he tells me so oh okay well that's good to know and every <laughs> no one was injured in the filming of of said test so correct but getting back to the the big bore guns and you know we've talked about pcp guns which is pre-charged pneumatic for folks that haven't messed around with these they they've only been playing with you know my daisy power line 880 which i still use to uh remind certain animals that they shouldn't be in my backyard (laughs) um but these pcp guns explain what they are how they work and basically the concept and kind of the care and feeding of them sure PCP uh, air rifles and pistols are the bomb, uh, and that's about it. And here's here's why. Uh, PCP just stands for pre-charged pneumatic, pneumatic with a P. Um, and the, the idea is they have an onboard air tank, an air supply that's refillable by the user, right? So some rifles might have a tube under the barrel, you know, kind of a long, maybe inch or so diameter tube that is the air reservoir. Uh, some, like Air Force, use a reservoir for the stock. You know, kind of a, a larger mini scuba tank looking thing that doubles as the, the rifle stock. Some of have something that comes straight down. But however it's done, uh, they store a supply of air. And the idea is you don't have to charge or pump this thing for every shot. You get multiple shots per fill. Um, you basically carry, carry your air, compressed air ready to go around with you. And, uh, you know, even affordable PCP air rifles now have... Uh, what's called regulators and that's the magic inside that takes this big tank of air and delivers a precise charge for each shot that you're gonna fire from this thing and the idea behind that is is as you shoot more the overall volume and pressure in the big tank goes down but the regulator makes sure that the same little bit of oomph is delivered uh, behind the projectile or pellet or slug for each shot so it's kind of the magic that levels everything out because as you know from the firearm world uh, if you keep velocity the same then accuracy starts to get pretty easy yeah all the all the projectiles land in the same place so the first shot to almost the last shot is is very minimal deviation from uh velocity that is absolutely the goal and now there is a point where the the big tank gets you know down to a level that it just can't sustain that anymore so in effect, what you're doing is if, if your tank holds 3,000 PSI, uh, you might shoot it down to about 2,000, at which point things are going to start to slow down, you know, coming out the, the muzzle end. Uh, so you're in a topping off game. You never run a tank completely dry. Yeah. So talk a little bit about you've got a I know you got a 25 set in there. Uh, you don't have a 50 cal uh, on hand right right now. But what are some of the things besides just target shooting? I mean, do do they work well for pest control things like that uh, am i allowed to say oh yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah they sure do um well you think about it like 25 is is probably my favorite overall rifle mm-hmm. and the reason for that is it it shoots a a decent diameter slug but when you work out the energy it's really close to a 22 long rifle yeah so you got a, a little fatter projectile in the 25 a little bit heavier like the the little slugs i like to use and in, in an air force uh 25 caliber rifle or 48 and 49 grain slugs so they're a little heavier they go a little slower but it all works out about the same as the 22 so that is just a super handy rifle and in that caliber range with the diameter and projectile weight you actually get a lot of shots mm-hmm. um, per per top off of the tank so to speak so yeah, they're great. I mean, a 25 will certainly take aim larger than, um, you know, squirrels. I wouldn't, you know, bring it for deer hunting, but, um, you know, you'd want something bigger for that. Uh, but varmints of all sorts. Now, now I will say 
that uh, I have found a 25 caliber with those slugs is outstanding for lumberjacking. Okay. Just hypothetically, if you had tree branches that were, you know, like pine tree branches that were maybe four inches in diameter Uh that were too high up in the tree and they were over your porch, (laughs) over your back deck, and they were dropping pine needles all over the place all the time, but you couldn't get there with a ladder and you were too much of a cheapskate to call a tree company, you could, hypothetically speaking, sit out in your back porch in a lounge chair and just chip away at the base of said branch until it falls off. and. Uh I, I can share with you in good authority that it is quite effective. And I'm sure the homeowners association where that would occur would just love to hear that, wouldn't they? Well, I do live under the iron fisted rule of a homeowners association. So, <laughs> so, it so wasn't that is you. a consideration. And that's where the moderators come in. You know, there's still a little noise, but it, it doesn't ah. sound like a firearm. <laughs> you have got me completely hooked. I really want to try this now. <laughs> so what are some of the other calibers it's, we've it's talked about? It's outstanding. <laughs> it is so satisfying. <laughs> Talk about, uh, you know, the calibers. 25 is is starting down the road of big mm-hmm. bore up to 50, which we know will take big time game. Yep. There are. There are bands of popular calibers. Uh, 25 is very popular. 30 caliber is very popular. Uh, 45 and now 50. We're starting to see some rifles hit the market in the 50 caliber range. So those are the bands. Now what you will find, and, and you find this in center fires too, that um, within each quote unquote caliber, there's a lot of variation. So you might get four five point four five six diameter projectiles or four five seven, and you'll find barrels that uh, uh, that are sized, you know, a few hundreds up and down either way or thousands up and down uh, just for optimizing your whatever whatever it is you want to do but those are those are the biggies i think in terms of popularity you know 25 30 45 and 50 ah okay okay we've talked about this before i think we've kind of got an inside joke when we're doing our video series gun cranks at some point we always ask one another what's the uh msrp on that particular product and about half Mm -hmm. the time we know it and about half the time you don't know it so i'm not asking the msrp here tom i'm just saying talk about some of the prices where i mean are these things a hundred dollars or they a thousand dollars Okay, so let's since we talked about PCP, let's let's kind of stick in that area. Let's get mm-hmm. out of the Walmart, you know. Right. That's pump that's up what I mean. Spring things, right? Let's yeah. get into the I'll call it the good stuff. Yeah. And the heavy stuff. There are big ranges, but this is where things have actually been pretty exciting over the past well, really 2 years now. Um Umarex came out and they kind of uh set the airgun world on fire with the launch of their Gauntlet Mm -hmm. series and you might even have one of those i don't know it seems like you've talked about them before but um they came out with a 177 caliber standard bb pellet size and the beauty of this was that it's a pcp gun with a huge air tank in the forend uh that would give you about 90 shots before you had to top off the air yeah that's a lot and the other thing is they brought earlier i talked about regulators they they brought that into a mainstream rifle which that it, it may have been done in some niche fashion, but they kind of mainstreamed that, you know, before good regulators that gave you shot to shot consistency were in the, the realm of thousand and two and three thousand dollar air rifles. They kind of brought that mainstream and they since then they've released gauntlets in uh, 22 and now 25 caliber too. you know, same types of benefits. So rifles like that started appearing on the scene and you see them from other other manufacturers as well, you know, Gamo and Hatsan and and others in the multi, you know, few hundred dollar range. So I don't remember the gauntlet MSRP offhand, but it's, it's a couple hundred bucks, you know, give or take some, some tens, uh, which is astounding considering that, that the PCP world was filled with four digit price tags. Right. Now it still is. You can still buy just masterpieces of air gun design for, for a few thousand dollars and they are gorgeous and worth it. Um, But but the companies have really kind of brought PCP to the mainstream. Yeah. I was going to say that's the analogy. It kind of went from the custom gun market to the mass market now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing that um, that really made that work was the supply of air. So a couple of years ago, you know, say three years ago, if you had a PCP rifle of any kind, you had to have an at-home either one of a few things. You had to have an at-home compressor, which were four-digit you know, price tags, or you had to have a giant carbon fiber tank 
you know, to hold compressed air and you'd get that thing filled at a dive shop or a, a paintball center, you know, every week, month, however, depending on how much you shoot, you'd use that to type off your rifle. Uh, but, but more recently, uh, companies like Benjamin and Pyramid and uh, Hotson has one too, and Umarex has one now, uh, have started launching these, that are offering these um, portable compressors. And they'll run off a standard wall outlet or off your car or ATV or boat. Um, so, you know, these things are maybe a foot 12 by 10 by eight inches, give or take, and they will fill up your air rifles. They're not designed for filling big tanks, you know, but they will fill all your toys and you can take them with you to the range, you know, plug the thing under your car battery. And you're, you're all set for the day. So that is also, you know, that and the combination of affordable air rifles is really kind of uh, exploded the market. So to speak, <laughs> I was going to say, maybe not use that terminology in that particular <laughs> yeah. instance. Hey, I shouldn't say this, but I have I have yet to blow anything up. I've yeah. uh, I've heard of it happening, but uh, you know, so far and, and these things to to be serious for a second, especially the uh, even the small portable pumps have all sorts of safety features. You know, they got release valves and automatic shutoffs and overheating sensors and all these kind of things. Yeah. So. They, they always tell you to watch it while it's filling, but they're, they're really well designed and, you know, have multiple, uh, safety factors. So you don't, you know, try and put too much juice in something. Well, you know, and as we were sitting there talking about that, it kind of struck me that uh, I'm a scuba diver and we've all been indoctrinated into safety because those things, a full scuba tank is close to a bomb. If it would rupture, um, they're hard to rupture, but you know, if you knock a valve off about that, well, exactly. Even though that turned out to be fake, if you ever watch Mythbusters, yeah, they tested it several different ways. The, uh. The tanks, they do become projectiles, but they don't explode if you shoot them. But uh, simply knocking the valve off if, if it falls over could be a problem. I i can't think of a single even uh, anecdotal uh, report of a PCP rifle blowing up and killing 47 nuns and orphans or anything like that. I've just never heard of it. No, I haven't either. So still waiting on my first report. I talked to a guy who had a... Uh, a valve piece like a little adapter that connects one fitting to another type of fitting not mm-hmm. not the valve but just a little hunk of metal uh, uh that ruptured but apparently it wasn't anything serious so. yeah i i worry more about my uh, fill yoke that uh i will admit is a non-name brand and you wonder about the flexible <laughs> hose because yeah. a, a hose breaking loose at 3500 psi would probably whip around for a little while if you happen to be in the immediate area you just set up an excellent opportunity for a, a safety tip here that is a great point um you know with whatever kind of compressor or tank you're using those hoses have a little release valve so yeah when your when your rifle or tank or whatever is full, uh, always got to make sure and unspin that little release valve because if you try and pull a hose off that has forty five hundred pounds per square inch of pressure in it, you know, off a of fitting, you are exactly right. It's going to whip. So, yeah, something fierce. Well, that was the thing. And again, I don't have much experience filling these, but I do know from scuba diving, because we filled our own tanks being a public safety diving, we went to the fire station and had all the required uh, equipment and, and uh, compressors, but Take it slow. Don't get in a big hurry, because when you get in a big yeah. hurry, you'll do dumb stuff like just trying to pull the, the hoses off or whatever, and that's when you can get into, into trouble. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. One question I was sitting here thinking, because you've got me convinced I need to talk to our good friends at Umarex, and I want a 25 caliber because I'm a huge squirrel hunter, love to hunt squirrel. And the season just came in here. So it's time that I go out and actually, and far as I know, I think it's, it's a legal weapon here in our state. What about temperature? Because, you know, our squirrel season starts when it's 90 plus and it ends, you know, sometime in January where it may be 20 below mm-hmm. zero. How, how big of a factor if I take my PCP rifle from my, garage or house and then take it out to the field and it's you know 35 degrees a big issue there uh you might lose a little velocity at it there's you know a lot of that comes from the co2 world you know those little canisters Mm -hmm. uh, that you use in little air pistols and some rifles they'll you shoot them too fast they'll get cold you know from the pressure release and start to lose a little a little oomph um i've not had big issues with pcp rifles 
in that in that realm. I mean, physics is physics, so you know, you reduce the temperature, pressure goes down a little bit. But yeah. um, you know, with with everything going on in there, it's not something I'd lose a lot of sleep over. I wouldn't leave your rifle sitting on the front porch overnight before you go. Yeah. But um, especially if you shoot the thing once in a while, it'll warm up a bit too. Yeah. So. Well, when we were diving under the ice, you know, it wasn't really an issue, but you don't get any colder than about 33 degrees. So I, uh, yeah. I just wondered about that. So are you going to be doing beach landings with your 25 caliber? Is that, that's an option. Is that what I heard you just say? Or? Well, I could, I'm thinking mm-hmm. come up out of the water and snipe the squirrels and then go back <laughs> down. And there was nice. a, <laughs> there was a, a long time, kind of one of my heroes grown up, a uh, local outdoor writer a guy named Bayou Bill. And he coined the term squirrelishing. And what he would do is he would float creeks in a John boat, uh, bass fishing for smallmouth bass. But he took his 22 when the, the squirrel season was in. And when you see that squirrel, you know, hanging down over the water, he'd pot it with the 22 and then he'd row over and pick it up, go right back to fishing. So that was squirrelishing. <laughs> so I may try that sometime. Nice. And one qu- question that I got to admit, I didn't do much research on. I've, it's one of those things I've kind of heard of, but uh, you just were talking about it, and it's really got me intrigued, is is the uh, regulators, is that what it's called? The mm-hmm. silencers for air rifles? Talk a little oh, bit. moderators. More. Moderators, there, that's there it. There are regulators, too, but sure, different things. that's a part yeah. inside. But what, yeah, moderators, Correct. that's what I was going for. Tell me, <laughs> just between you and I, tell me about those. <laughs> They, uh, no problem. They are absolutely legal. Now don't, don't, uh, move them over to a center fire rifle or pistol of any <laughs> kind. They probably wouldn't handle it anyway. Right. Um, you know, the pressures are radically different coming out the fire end and there's no fire. So the temperature is a little different too. Uh, but as long as you're using it on an air gun, um, you are good to go. And again, they'll, they'll ship straight to your house. So. Uh, I guess maybe you're safer calling them moderators. That yeah. doesn't sound so scary to those not in the know, but, um, you know, pretty, pretty sophisticated things. How much they reduce the signature? A uh, good bit. I have some, you know, that, that are removable off the end. Um, I would, I would make a rough analogy to what you see on center fires, uh-huh. you know, given that the scale isn't linear, but if a center fire rifle goes from 160 some decibels to 130, uh, that's probably a similar ratio to what I see yeah. on uh, air guns. I've never, you know, I don't have the equipment to measure it, but um, it doesn't make it soundless. You're still right. dealing with a large expulsion of high pressure air, uh, but it does certainly, you know, knocks a good bit off of, off of it. Now, a lot of air rifles actually go, they kind of do a fully shrouded approach. Uh-huh. So, you know, since it's legal and not a cost driver and can come right on the, the rifle from the factory, um, you basically get an integrated suppressor slash moderator, you know, along the length of the barrel. And so it does quiet it enough that homeowner associations don't come calling. <laughs> it depends on your caliber. I'm so. asking for a friend. <laughs> I have a, um, the Gamo Urban 22, which is probably, you know, my, my favorite combination of noise versus thump. It's it's 22 caliber PCP rifle with a, a suppressor on the end. And uh, that one's pretty darn good for the neighborhood. You'll hear the the thwacks, you sure. know, and you'll you'll, but it won't sound anything like uh, like on fire. Now twenty fives, uh, you'll you'll hear them. Yeah. So the the neighbors will know you're you're either nailing something with a nail gun or uh, something along those lines. So. I like that a nail gun. Yeah. Because we're doing a lot of construction. I mean, a friend of mine's doing a lot of construction at their house, so. I, uh, yeah. yeah, you know what you do if you'd be really tricky. Just throw like a a ladder and a and a nail gun with a hose on it out in the backyard. Just let it sit there. Yeah, and then you can shoot all day long, and people just assume you're you know you're doing something like that. Huh. But I didn't I didn't recommend that. Sure. Well, there's a serious application here, as much as I'm being serious too. But no, these guns are not quiet. If you live in a neighborhood that or city that forbids shooting, you know, any type of you know weapon that expels a projectile, and in most places. If they have those kind of ordinances, BB guns fall under it. So yeah. you got to be cognizant of the fact, even if your backyard is fenced in, these things, especially the big boars, still make noise. And if you've got a neighbor that gets upset by that kind of stuff, it's entirely possible you may have to to deal with my uh, former coworkers. So they're great in a lot of ways, but they are not a stealth weapon, strictly speaking. No, no. Um... 
And you're right. Do check your your local regulations because uh, a lot of a lot of areas inside of city limits do have ordinances like that, and they do apply to air powered yep. rifles and pistols and. And unfortunately, people that would call the police on you don't care if you're shooting a 458 Winchester or a 25 caliber PCP rifle. Exactly. Well, Tom, it's been great. You've, you've got me all juiced up. I, I really seriously, I'm going to have to call our friends and say, you're going to ship me one of those because let's just say I like to shoot squirrels a lot. And uh, it sounds like the 25 might be the way to go. So I can, I can write a good report on that and uh, have, have a little fun doing it. There you go. Pick pick up that new twenty five gauntlet. Yeah, lots lots of shots before you top off, and you'll be good to go. I like that idea a lot. And then when I get the fence up in the backyard, if they start attacking the feeder, I can get my moderator, and you know, I can <laughs> I can look at it. I wouldn't do anything, you know, against local ordinances, but I can well, of just not. I can just sit there and think about it. But anyway, well, it's been great talking to you about big bore air guns, and I hope our listeners have caught the fever because I certainly have. And we'll well, you you and I have talked about for video, we need to do something silly but safe with air guns. So we'll have to come up with something like that here pretty soon. I think there's uh, I think there's some kind of pentathlon in the uh, (laughs) cards. You know, have to come up with the events. I like that. And we can get some uh, some listener suggestions on pentathlon events. Oh, that's an idea. That's an idea. Yeah. But it's got to involve something like a recliner, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, we're not athletes by any stretch of the imagination. So, <laughs> well, Tom, it's been great talking to you. And now you got to get back and commit some more journalism. There you go. Thanks for having me. Our talk with Tom was fun and informative, and I think there is a big bore air rifle in my future to replace my trusty Red Rider. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first in the business, and we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast catcher, YouTube, and of course at GunsMagazine.com. And please, while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com and AmericanCop.com. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And please don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, 1791 Gun Leather. Visit them at 1791gunleather.com. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.